Today, we're breaking down the FDA's latest statement on GLP-1 medications, discussing the supposed end of the shortage and what this means for compounded trisepatide, with some questions about just how in stock Eli Lilly really is. Welcome back to The Downsized. In our last video, we covered the FDA's announcement about the resolve shortages of GLP-1 medications, terzeptides at Bound and Manjaro. Today, we're taking a closer look at the FDA's shortage lists and their latest statement titled, FDA clarifies policies for compounders as national GLP-1 supply begins to stabilize. It was published yesterday, October 2nd. Now that Eli Lilly has convinced the FDA that their GLP-1 medications are no longer in shortage, the situation for compound trisepatide is about to shift. But before we jump in, just a reminder, we're not doctors or lawyers. We're just regular people sharing our personal experiences and insights. So please consult your healthcare provider or legal expert for any medical or legal decisions. We'll explore the FDA's new policies and how Eli Lilly's increased production or supposed increased production has led to restrictions on compounded terzepatide. This could have significant implications for those relying on compounded terzepatide like Lorraine and I to make this life-saving treatment for the disease of obesity more affordable and more accessible. As always, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you never miss an update from us here at The Downsized. Let's get into it. Well, and for those of you, I mean, if, if this is your first time coming, and I know this is a hot topic, just to give you a little background on Lorraine and I, uh, we have been on a GLP-1 adventure, as I call it. Lots of folks call it a journey for the last uh, year. Yeah, really. we, just, right? so we, we started... just crossed over our year, uh, our anniversary. One year on compound trisepatide for me, yep. I've lost over 50 pounds. I went from... 193 to 153. I lost an average of 1.58 pounds a week to get to my goal. Yep. And I had, we started <laughs> at the exact same time. So it's been a year as well. So September 23rd was when we started. 20, 29th. 29th. Yeah. I'm sorry. 29th. And I've taken a combination of compounded trisepatide, Zepabound, and Monjaro. So I've taken both of the branded versions, Monjaro, before prior to Zepbound being approved for weight loss. And both of those back to compounded trisepatide because of shortages, because Eli Lilly honestly just couldn't keep up. Mm -hmm. We weren't able to get the medication. And we're not covered by insurance no. for this medication. Our insurance doesn't cover any weight loss medications. So that's why I started on compounded in the first place. And we're paying out of pocket. I mean, mm -hmm. it just what it is, is what it is. And in my experience, I did not have any difference with the three medications. So as much as Lily wants to tell you that all compounding is bad, it's it's hard for you, it doesn't work, it has worked. Worked have, for me. <laughs> it's worked for me, great. I have lost the same amount of weight. I've had the same side effects. I have noticed no difference if it hadn't said. What's your total weight loss? Uh, 78 pounds. Yeah, it's important. If it hadn't said Zep bound on it, I wouldn't have known versus the compounding the in the, the syringe. Mm -hmm. So. What we wanted to do today was really take a look at some of the stuff that's going on. I did a video yesterday. I'll leave a link to it uh, talking about it going off shortage. But I wanted to let me pull up some stuff here and take a look. First of all, this is the FDA shortage page <laughs> that if you don't know how to do it, I'll leave a link in there. But you can go type for any drug. The FDA keeps a list of them. And up until now, uh, up until yesterday, it had said it was in shortage, and then the Trisepatide. list, you know, Trisepatide was in shortage, and then the list below of all the, and there's a lot longer list, Monjaro and Zepbound, uh, would show you that it had various availabilities. So it lists it by dose? It does list it by dose. So now all another, the doses are They're all down are, there, if you are, kept scrolling. Um, are all listed available. As, as available, although or, we still have people reporting to us that they can't find right. certain doses in certain. So their areas list, of the, the status is listed as resolved, is, is what the FDA says. How nice. Now, what's interesting is is the large block, a paragraph next to the dosage. So you see that very first one, Monjaro, ten milligram, and I'll read it to you verbatim. It says, even when a medication is available, patients may not always be able to immediately fill their prescription at a particular pharmacy. That is especially true for refrigerated products mm -hmm. and products with multiple dose strings due to factors like ordering practices and incentives. Cold chain logistical considerations and retailer capacity constraints, patients may experience variability at a particular pharmacy location regardless of whether a drug is in shortage. So I've never seen them add this long caveat that looks like it was written by the manufacturer. Yeah, so wait, scroll. 
let's let me look at this again. Go back a little bit. So <laughs> even when a medication is available, patients may not always be able to immediately fill their prescription at a particular pharmacy. And they're saying especially true for refrigerated products, which mm -hmm. Zeb Bound and Manjaro are. Products with multiple dose strengths, yeah. like Zeb Bound and Manjaro, have multiple strengths due to factors like ordering practices and incentives. Mm -hmm. Incentives. Yeah, that, that's a it's a lot. That's the whole PBM thing. That's cold chain logistical considerations. Like maybe they don't have enough refrigerated trucks to move mm -hmm. it around. Right. Sure. Retailer capacity constraints. Well, I know at the Walgreens and CVS, their little refrigerator only holds can so only much. hold so much. Uh, so they're saying essentially an individual out of stock isn't necessarily a shortage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, I could go to Walmart and see Cheerios out of stock and that's not a Cheerios shortage. I get right, that. Right. It is a very strange caveat to put the incentives. I mean, it looks like it was written by Eli Lilly to me, not uh -huh. by the FDA. Well, it's on the F this is on the FDA this website. This is the FDA website, correct. Hmm. So what I would say here is this is all just weird and, and terrifying and <laughs> scary. And we've all relied on these medications. If you are experiencing what, if you cannot get your medication and you have a prescription for Zep Bounded and Manjaro, go to the FDA website and report a shortage. They can short, sort out themselves whether any of these, these things happen. That's not up to us to do. How would we if know? It's a, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. If, it, if you are seeing it as a shortage, go report it as a shortage. I will leave a link in the description. The more information we give the FDA, the better off we're all going to be. Mm -hmm. If I can't get it at my local pharmacy, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, it's a shortage. It's not up to me to know why it's a shortage. Yeah. I don't honestly care. I, I don't care. I just <laughs> so, want my medication. So moving on, the FDA also yesterday released an entire letter. And here it is. You obviously can't read it. I will put a link to it in the description and we're going to read through this verbatim and discuss it. So this is directly from the FDA's website. It's called the FDA clarifies policies for compounders as national GLP-1 supply begins to stabilize. It was published. Policies for compounders. Correct. Okay. So they say the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has determined the shortage of terzepatide injection a glucagon-like peptide one, GLP-1 medication, mm -hmm. has been resolved. Mm -hmm. Terzepatide injection has been in shortage since 2022 due to increased demand. True. So reading directly from the FDA's letter, <laughs> FDA confirmed with the drugs manufacturer that their stated product availability and manufacturing capacity can meet the present and projected national demand. Patients and prescribers. Wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. so that's Eli Lilly. That's Eli Lilly. Is saying they can meet product availability, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. They can they can meet the present and projected national demand. Right. All right. Okay. Again, <laughs> if you're seeing a shortage, report it. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Continue. And again, there's 40% of America that is obese or over, or, or has right. the disease. I don't of obesity. think they are prepared for the projected no, national not. demand. Uh, patients and prescribers are reading from the le from this note. Patients and prescribers may still see intermittent localized supply disruptions as the products move through the supply chain from the manufacturer and distributor to local pharmacies. The FDA goes on to say the FDA reminds compounders of the legal restrictions of making copies of FDA approved drugs. Compounded drugs are not approved by the FDA. They never have that. been. So that's. Right. Don't care. Compounding pharmacies are state regulated, not FDA regulated. FDA approved drugs, and I'm reading from them, FDA approved drugs go through the FDA's rigorous review for safety, effectiveness, and quality as part of the pre-market approval process. Compounded drugs must meet conditions to qualify for exemptions under sections 503A and 503B of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic FD&C Act among the conditions. So they're spelling out the what we have what we have been talking about, but this is directly exist. from the FDA. Mm -hmm. So the first point, Section 503A from the FDA of the FDNC Act includes restrictions on compounding drugs that are essentially copies of a commercially available drug. When a drug shortage is resolved, FDA generally considers the drug to be commercially available. 
certain amounts are permissible under the law as long as compounding is not done regularly or in an inordinate amount. Can we de define inordinate amounts? <laughs> well, that's that's the challenge. Yeah. What is so an, again? An we're not lawyers. Amount. We're not lawyers. I'm just someone who wants to get my compounded trisepatide. But I went back to the FDA site and, and dove in deeper. I cannot find a definition of inordinate amount or regular. Mm -hmm. So is that once a day, once a week, once a month? And why is that in quotes? <laughs> That's directly from them. Right. Oh, you're just quoting this. Th this oh, entire this thing, thing is directly from them. Mm -hmm. But they have it in quotes inside of their. They have their, it in quotes. So mm -hmm. who are they quoting? <laughs> It's, they're quoting one of the amounts. one of the actual laws, so they're going okay. back to the regulation and All quoting right. it. Mm -hmm. um, my belief as a non-lawyer is that that is fuzzy enough that there will be people fighting in court over this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so certain amounts are permissible under the law as long as the compounding is not done regularly or in an inordinate amounts right. not done regularly so they can't be churning this out 24 right. 7 and they can't be putting out an inordinate amount of medication However so if they're making it well, a dose here a dose there well so let's go on and we'll come we'll, we'll go okay. so the next point they make section 503b of the fdnc act restricts outsourcing facilities from making compounded drugs so outsourcing facilities being those essentially factories mm -hmm. that make these drugs for hospitals for mm -hmm. you know, larger facilities so they restrict outsourcing facilities from making compounded drugs that are essentially a copy of one or more fda approved drugs among other things this means the compounded drug may not be identical or nearly identical to an fda approved drug unless the approved drug is on the fda's drug shortage list okay current shortage status of glp1 glp1 products as of October 2nd, 2024, terzepatide injection shortage resolved, dulaglutide injection in shortage, semaglutide injection in shortage. Manufacturer has reported all but one of the presentations are available, so that's no nor disc. Liraglutide injection in shortage. Manufacturer has reported two presentations are available and three have limited availability. So they're talking about all the GLP ones. They go on to say the agency will continue to work with manufacturers to help resolve the current shortages. As shortages resolve, we'll closely monitor the situation and provide any assistance we can to help manufacturers ensure an adequate supply before determining that a shortage is resolved. The FDA considers a variety of factors, including the company's ability to meet current and historical demand, the amount in the manufacturer's stock, effective market share, ability of alternate manufacturers to cover the demand, and confirmed market stabilization. Please visit the FDA's drug shortages database, which I showed you earlier. I'll leave a link in the description to for the most recent information on the status of GLP-1 medicines and other drugs in shortage. So this is their update. So go back to go back up a little bit more mm -hmm. that this paragraph, right? Where it talks about the 503 B. So 503 B mm -hmm. pharmacies, is that the Hallandale? No, most of those are 503 A's. Those are five. And a few of them are both, but they have to be in separate facilities. So I think like a merge of a 503 A and a 503 B. But Hallandale, Akita, Red Rock are all A's. And but this is talking about 503B mm -hmm. restricts outsourcing facilities from making compounded drugs that are essentially a copy. Right. So basically the Bs will just have to stop. They have uh, some window. Do we know any pharmacies that are 503Bs? Is it like uh, Neil's Compounding Pharmacy no, no, down the street? No, a 503B <clears throat> is like a factory. <clears throat> a factory. Right. They're making it at in volume at mass. Whereas a 503A is making individual prescriptions. So they're filling it for Lorraine. So Hallandale 503A. Mm -hmm. Akita Pharmacy. Yep. 503A. Correct. Red Rock Pharmacy 503A. Yep. So this doesn't have to do with that. That B part does not. The 503A does. So Section 503A, we'll read it again, of the FDNC Act includes restrictions on compounding drugs that are essentially copies of a commercially available drug. When a drug shortage is resolved, oh, okay. the FDA generally considers the drug to be commercially available. 
certain amounts are permissible under the law as long as the compounding is not done regularly or in an inordinate amount. So there's a whole set of regulations around it that basically give compounding pharmacies permission to make specific medications for specific people, whether there's an allergy or some something else like that. This is where... But it can't be an exact copy. It can't be an exact copy. So if Mochi puts niamenicide in mm-hmm. with mitrazepatide, is that... Does that... Depends on who you ask. Make it okay for them to keep compounding So again, it? Not, a, not a, we are neither doctors nor attorneys. And it depends on who you ask. What I believe is that the larger telehealth companies and compounders will take the risk and continue to, the doctors will prescribe you something with whatever it is you need. Mm -hmm. Compounders will make it Mm -hmm. and this will all end up in court. And some okay. judge somewhere will decide what regularly or inordinate amounts are and whether yeah. the difference medically is a big enough difference to warrant. So, so who's going to stop my provider Mochi Health from making compounded medication? Who enforces this? Uh, well, the FDA can send out letters. Uh-huh. So like a cease and desist. Like a cease and desist letter from the FDA. And Eli mm-hmm. Lilly will certainly have their attorney send out letters. So for many of the smaller ones... They're going to look at that and go, it's not worth our trouble. It's not worth it. We're, we're, we're out. We're closing up shop and we're, heading yeah. back to wherever we came from. The larger ones who are making big bucks. They're going to say, come at me, bro. Right. They're going to say, and because there are several trade associations of compounding pharmacies, I would suspect the trade association and some we'll of the larger together. ones will band together. To fight the... right behemoth of Eli Lilly right. and, and it's all billions you know, of dollars. You know, Eli Lilly's making billions on Zeb Bound and Majora, right? right? Didn't we, didn't we, mm-hmm. didn't we report that they made yep. the last quarter over a billion dollars in profit? I think that was the number. Yeah. Uh, I don't think these compounding pharmacies have the resources that Eli Lilly has. If Eli Lilly wanted to come and shut somebody down, seems like they could are they going to well they to? don't they don't have any enforcement power other than the law they could they can't they could shoot there's no eli lilly police that could, go hey could, you shut down could eli lilly file a lawsuit Absolutely. against hallandale pharmacy yes and i think that eventually that's what happens i think this all cool. gets sorted out in court so they're going to restrict the pharmacy so i have an online telehealth provider mm-hmm. so how does that online telehealth provider come in they can just Move around pharmacy. Pharmacy. If I were Lily, I would send cease and desist to everybody. You to just everybody. You send it to everybody who's touched this stuff, and you you hope you can swat down as many problems as you like. Where would I find such a master list of people producing compounded trisepatide? Is there such a place? Well, there are state regulated pharmacies, so you can mm-hmm. go to the states and, and see where they are. Because state regulations are, I mean, they're public, public record. records, yep. so the states mm-hmm. would have. And I think most of them, I think most of them are pretty common knowledge. I don't think it's a big secret that they're making things, because you remember yeah. the, they're not just making terzepatide; they're making all sorts of other compounded products. Right. right. Compounding pharmacies have been around for a couple hundred years in the United States. This is not a new thing. I just think it's going to take a lot of time and effort for yep. uh, anybody to shut down. Yeah. All the compounding pharmacies in America. Yeah. <laughs> I just, well, I think I, I think move one for Lily is a whole round of cease and desist letters that says we're off shortage. You are breaking our patents. And they just hope they swat down half of them, three quarters of them. So if I'm a compounding pharmacy and I get a cease and desist letter from Eli Lilly mm-hmm. and I don't cease and desist... And you say pound what? sand, Eli Lilly. <laughs> pound sand, Eli Lilly. Yeah. Well, Eli Lilly could then file a lawsuit against right. these individual compounding right. pharmacies. And so then, Eli Lilly would have to go on after each individual compounding pharmacies with individual mm-hmm. law lawsuits across all of these different states. Right. Now, we don't know what regulatory action at the FDA will take. There are no FDA police. Right. Well, I mean, the so FDA have, isn't enforcing. They're not an enforcement body, no. So who enforces the FDA's drug policies? Well, they can send out things and people are supposed to follow they're them. They're supposed to follow them. Right. And if they don't follow them. 
then it'll end up in court or the, they'll, or if it's a crim, if it crosses over into a criminal, criminal problem, then there will be, the police will become involved. Hmm. Interesting. So all that to say, put in your refills now, <laughs> put in your no, refills. but I don't, I'm not really, <laughs> they're not shutting it down today. I mean, nobody's Mochi health is still taking my reorder. I mean, we've seen a few uh, compounders already say that they were done. I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I guess I, I guess I'll panic when I can no longer get it. Today, right now, this minute, I can still get compounded trisepatide. Um, you know, we're just going to have to take it a day, a week at a time. When I, mm-hmm. when we first started reporting on this, I don't know, a month or two months ago, about oh, was it going to go away? Whatever, I like panicked, and I think it sends a lot of people into a panic because without this compounded trisepatide. Am I going to gain my 50 pounds back? All those clothes I threw away. Like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know, what's going to happen to us in the compounded trisepatide world? Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know, but I can't, I can't panic every time something else happens because lately it's been like every other day. Yeah. And I just, we have, we have other problems in the world. Like, For sure. And we're in West, we're in North Carolina, Western North Carolina, the people who, you know, don't have food or water or they're Homes. cut off from, yeah. yeah. So like really, well, so, I mean, for me, things. it becomes a, uh, if you're running Eli Lilly, what do you do? And if you're running a compounder, what do you do? And if you're running a telehealth, what do you do? And it's kind mm-hmm. of this gamesmanship of how does the law work? How does the business practices work? Yeah. And if you're Eli Lilly and you've got, unlimited cash and unlimited lawyers you go out and you blanket the world with cease and desist letters and you hope they all stop now i think the challenge of that is that is not a patient first mentality that is not a customer first mentality that is a profit first patent first mentality well and let me tell you if eli Lilly, if you're going to spend billions of dollars or whatever coming after compounders and online telehealth providers Mm -hmm. just lower the cost of your medicine we'll buy it yep i'd love to take Zeb bound in the pen form. Do you, I can get it at Walgreens now for myself for under a thousand dollars or five hundred and fifty dollars or I mean hell I pay what is it two twenty five a month with Mochi plus a seventy nine dollar membership fee. Lower your price below two hundred dollars. I'll drop Mochi in a hot second and go over to Zeb bound. You better believe it. Which honestly, you would think would be cheaper than the legal fees. Except that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so like Eli Lilly, if you're out there and you're listening, like. Nobody wants, nobody cares about compounded medication. No. People are driven by cost and effectiveness. Of course, we want the drugs to be safe. And I've, I've, you know, sample of one or sample of two says that these medications are safe. And we've talked to hundreds of people, you know, that have used compounded medications, compounded trisepatide, and safe and effective you know i I, as far as i know i'm not a doctor i'm not you know well but i I mean so again as a business question if you're lily so certainly if they said gosh it's all 199 dollars right right now today that would end compounding tomorrow (laughs) the other thing that it would do is it would be the best marketing and pr investment money you have ever spent yes because right now the glp1 compounded user community which is hundreds of thousands of people Mm -hmm. and the press that are picking these stories up see you as the bad guy right we are not loyal to lily we are not loyal to zep bounder manjaro and we're pissed off yeah you know, Elon Lily's been running some very touchy feely commercials around the Olympics, mm-hmm. around uh, Caitlin Clark and her basketball. And she wears the Lily logo on yeah, her sure. on her basketball jersey. Um, we, you know, we don't have anything against Eli Lilly. We 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 love these products that you've yep. created. We want to buy these products from you, but we cannot afford twelve hundred dollars a month or five fifty a month uh, with the coupon. So. Don't spend billions or millions taking these compounders out. Let's leave the compounders alone. They'll be fine. Give us a lower price drug. I don't know. It just feels like a very short-term, patent-focused, profit-focused decision 
when you should be building these brands in your company for the long term. You should be building loyalists in us. And you could. We could. They're not. They no. could. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll sit here and sing the praises of Eli Lilly all day long if they drop their price to $100 a month. You better believe it. <laughs> I will be your number one fan <laughs> and do videos every day on how great you are. But, I um, mean, until that time... Right now, they're seen as the big, greedy, corporate drug, big, big pharma, yeah. big drug, you know? So think about yeah. it. You, you can change the way you are perceived. You can change everything about it. And honestly, you can be wildly, wildly profitable doing it. And we want you to be rewarded for your innovation. We want you to be profitable. But we want a drug that we can afford because we know these drugs work. Mm -hmm. you know, we know these drugs are life changing. They're miracle drugs for millions of people with obesity. You know, and obesity is a disease and these drugs work. And uh, I'll, I'll take take I'll keep taking them until. I can't or until something better comes along. You yeah. know, I, I know I. You had Eli Lilly, you would have a customer in us for life, yeah. <laughs> for life, basically, because we're not ever planning on going off these drugs. Yeah. Um, and there are already people in the community calling for boycotting the Eli Lilly. They're calling for uh, go to Nova Nordisk, use the semaglutide, move on. Eek. You know, I have to do what's best for me. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know that semaglutide would work for me as well as I don't know. Um and Nova Nordisk is no But for half the <laughs> no price, is it not worth, worth a shot? Uh, I mean, we could. I mean, I guess the compounding pharmacies will still be compounding semaglutide yep, because they're right still now. on the shortage list. I had a, a, a viewer reach out to me and ask, you know, should we, hey, Lorraine, maybe we should slip, slip, switch over to compounded semaglutide. I mean, if push came to shove, if I couldn't, if I was out of compounders resepatide and I could not get any more, would I go to semaglutide, compounded semaglutide? Probably. I mean, I don't know. May I guess I'd have to. Is it worth a shot? Absolutely it's worth a shot. If there's nothing else, if I, I can't pay five fifty a month times every member of my family forever, like that's just not it's just not feasible. So I'll leave the link to these in the description if you guys want to go check it out and if you really want to get wonky and and all the details all the regulations are on the fda website you can go dive deep into them um that's our conversation for today that kind of wraps up this video uh, we hope it breaks down the fda's uh, latest statement a little bit for you and what what it could mean for compounded trisepatite is giving you a few insights it's still fuzzy it's still terrifying but don't panic yeah like let's not panic we I'm not going to panic until I have no more and I cannot get any more. <laughs> so that might be sooner rather than later. I don't know, but I can't, you can't let these companies and these, these people like jerk us around like this. We, yeah. we have to, we have to think positively. So, Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, if you're watching this and you've watched this far, please uh, hit like and subscribe. That helps other people looking for information about trisepatide, Zebbalna Manjaro. That, that helps them find us. It helps us spread the word about these medications. And uh, turn on the notifications so you don't miss an update from us here at The Downsized. And be sure to join us tonight for Downsized Live at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, where we'll talk about all this, I'm sure. I'm sure this will be the I'm only sure topic. this will be the hot topic. Um, and there will be <laughs> questions and concerns and tears, and it won't be good, I'm sure. But it'll it'll be great. Uh We'll dive deep into all those questions you have. And, and, and any other questions you yeah. may have. Um, we love doing live shows because we love to talk to our audience, at, see what's going on with them, what questions they have, what experience we have maybe with their questions. So tune in. It's always, it's always a fun hour or so. All right. Well, we'll see you then. I'm Lorraine Durham. And I'm Christopher Durham. And we are The Downsized. Bye.